My name is Karen Buchanan. I'm curator at Gerlach Museum. We're a museum of local history. There's also a library and an archive here in this building, which used to be a nuclear bunker. So 2020 was a big year for us. First of all, of course, we were hit, as everyone else was, by the pandemic. But in October of that year, we were announced as winner of Art Fund Museum of the Year. That's allowed us to do two key things that have been very important to our offering. One is to invest in equipment that we can now use to make our digital offerings, our, our broadcasts and our recordings of our events a lot more professional. But we've also been able to employ a person specifically to work on our education and outreach activities. We're pleased to be hosting an event today organised by Expo North in conjunction with Museums Heritage Highland, which is bringing together museum curators and uh, learning experts, not just from the Highlands, but from other parts of the UK. It's the first in-person event we've had in quite a long time, and um, it's given us a chance to think about how we're taking our activities into the future, both as individuals and as a collective. Good morning, everybody. Matin va, ahuladunya, agus falcha. Welcome to Gearlock Museum. It's, I'm delighted to see so many of you here today for our first in-person gathering in over two years. Our session today is looking at museums and COVID, um, museums and education post-COVID, and this session is brought to you by Expo North, with support from Museums and Heritage Highland. I'm Nicola Henderson. I work as the heritage specialist for Expo North, and Expo North Heritage was launched just before the pandemic with the aim of supporting museums to innovate for a more sustainable future. We can offer time and expertise in areas of digital, audience, product or business development, so if we can help at all, please do get in touch. But back to today, and we're here to discuss museums and education. As a practice, museum education is never not transforming. Whether we're responding to changes in audience expectations or to pedagogical approaches, and in recent years, we've been responding to the disruption caused by the pandemic, um, which has led to virtual formats coming to the floor, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as reassessing how our programmes address, address key societal issues such as climate change to racial justice. For education, digital matters for several reasons. It meets people where they are, it increases access by allowing people to connect even if they physically cannot be present, and it allows content creators to easily change and adapt their engagement approaches. It offers new pathways for co-creation and a multitude of tools related to accessibility. But digital is not a solution, it is only a tool. And many of the other tools we use are in demand again. We know how important being together physically in our communities is. And as we look to re-establish our learning programmes that were popular beforehand, while continuing to capitalise on the opportunities presented by digital, we ask what does a blended education programme look like for small to medium-sized museums? And how can we help deliver that together? So this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by four speakers who are going to talk about some of the ways that they have worked extremely pass hard over the past two years to evolve and diversify the methodologies they use to engage with their audiences. Um, so we'll first of all have some presentations from them on their work, and then I'd like to invite you all to ask some questions as part of our Q&A after that. First up today is Steve Gardham, who is the director of the Roald Dahl Museum and Story Centre. Steve has been director of the Roald Dahl Museum in Great Missenden since 2015. He has worked in cultural heritage organisations of all sizes for over 25 years, including the London Metropolitan Archives, Imperial War Museums and London Transport Museum. Steve. Thanks very much. Oh, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be here. Right, well, I've come a long way, so let me show you where I've come from. So we are up here. I've come from all the way down here. <laughs> it was lovely. I came on the, the Caledonian Sleeper, which is something I've always wanted to do. So I'm already having a great time. Um, let me tell you a bit more about my museum. That's what I want to introduce us. So we are close to, but not actually in that London. We're in this lovely part, not the hills that you have up here, it's true, but very nice hills by English standards. Uh, the Chiltern Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. So it's only about 30 miles from central London, but it is a world away. And this is the High Street. Uh, that's where we are. That's a slightly better view of the front of our museum. It was an old coaching inn, and it was converted and opened as a museum in about 2005. Fun fact, folks. So we actually have a wonderful bit of film. Roald Dahl sat on that windowsill there, <laughs> pointing 
further down the high street saying, that's the building that I had in mind for Sophie's orphanage in the BFG. Mm -hmm. And so if you read the BFG, when Sophie first catches eyes on the giant at the witching hour, he is on the other side of the street looking through the upstairs windows. In other words, that mural is exactly where it should be, according to the book. So this is our site. Old coaching in, new build bits. It's about 1,000 square metres of interior space, all told. This is what it's all about. Families coming in, having a wonderful time with us. The heart of the museum is the preserved interior of Roald Dahl's writing heart. It was moved from his family home into the museum. Um, and this is the place that those stories and characters beloved across the world were born. It's fantastic. So what you should know from this is we are rural. We are small. We are awesome. <laughs> We're about literacy and creativity. Our collection, as well as Roald Dahl's writing, is his amazing archive, his working and personal papers, the stories behind the stories, seeing how his creativity worked in practice. And we use that as an example to enable our visitors to think more carefully and closely about their own creative potential. And we are, or we were, before the pandemic, full for school visits on site. So pre-COVID, this is what we were like. We had about 60,000 general visitors a year on average, 10,000 school visitors. 10,000 school visitors, and that came through about 350 school sessions a year, um, about 10 per week on average times 35 term weeks a year. And we were basically booked out. I mean, I say just above 93%. In real terms, that was a few, a few sessions towards the end of terms or late cancellations that we couldn't fill. You know, de facto, we were fully booked. Interesting, schools could only really come from within a 90 minute drive. That was our catchment area because schools have got to get back for final bell and home time. So, Spring 2020, what the, what's going on? That's the feeling, right? That's the feeling we all remember from two years ago. And so this is a big question, what can we do? Turns out within a few weeks, once the government sorted it out, our museum had to pretty much furlough everybody because we had no income, we had, uh, we're an independent museum, we don't get any regular public funding. So we earn most of what we, what we need. Uh, we are generally, generously supported, have been generously supported by the Dahl family and the Dahl company, but not completely. So furlough was a big deal for us, as it was for so many organisations. And the furlough rules were no actual work is allowed if you're on furlough. So you could talk to each other. Oh, Zoom seems useful for that. That's nice. Um, but what I remember from this time is this awful feeling of FOMO, that very modern acronym, fear of missing out. So I was starting to watch all those really annoying people on social media going, yeah, I've just learned to play the guitar, I've started writing a novel, you know, I bake sourdough bread. Okay, I bake sourdough bread, but I want you to understand I was doing this before the pandemic, I just got better in the last two years. Anyway. But there was that, but then on a professional level, there was that FOMO going on, seeing other organisations, I assume organisations with a different funding model where staff didn't have to be furloughed, starting to put out really fun bits of you know online content and i said i want to do that but i can't do that because of the further rules what this needed what it always needs when you're starting to worry about other people doing stuff and feeling the prickling of wanting to do something similar is you just have to slow down and be patient and that patience allowed us to start seeing an opportunity so what do we already know? We, we know our school programme works. That's not just based on the amount of people booking it. You know, we evaluate it. We get great feedback from teachers. And the things that teachers tell us is that our educators make the difference. That's the key thing. Zoom seems useful. Um, now, we don't know if, when schools will visit museums again, but we know that everybody agrees that getting kids back into school is super important for lots of reasons, you know, but not least the, 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 the kids' own um, social and educational well-being. So we started to look at it differently. We knew we couldn't do anything right now. We couldn't, you know, you know, do a swift pivot to digital, as the phrase, you know, uh, I've heard used was at the time. But we realised that, you know, we know that we've got this great offer for schools. Literacy and creativity are never going to go out of style, on a, you know, in an education sense. And there's a massive potential school market here when you combine that with the popularity of Roald Dahl's stories. So we came up with the idea, not particularly original or unique, but our twist on it was that we wanted to do online learning, but for the long term, not for lockdown. So the parameters for this, well, we know that because of the reading age of Roald Dahl stories, we're talking about, in English education terms, key stage two or three, which is upper primary, lower secondary. Um, 
What we really wanted to do, and this is the long-term bit, is we didn't want to be doing stuff, because of that age range, we didn't want to be doing stuff for kids on individual devices at home during lockdown. We wanted it to be an experience that they were having in their classroom together. So we were looking to a point, even though it was incredibly hard to do for all of us back in 2020, we were trying to look ahead to a point where the pandemic was past, which is difficult, but it, it felt like the right choice for us. We knew that live facilitation would be critical because we know that our educators make the difference. And we wanted it to be interactive, not a chalk and talk. We did see, and I'm not here to critique what other museums did for their own audiences, but we, we saw some other examples of online education programs that were perhaps more geared to secondary, that they were definitely done for lockdown, and students at home on individual screens, and they were people talking to a PowerPoint, says the man talking to a PowerPoint. But nevertheless, we wanted to try and go beyond that. Um, and we had to think for the long term because, you know, we were on furlough. And this is all back in the spring of 2020 before flexible furlough had been introduced. That was the thing that started to make a difference, but one had to be patient. You'd get the teaser trailer of announcement from government, then you'd have to wait a bit for the bit more detail. You had to keep exercising patience in that time. I'm sure you can all remember that. But our driving thing was to, as close to a real life visit as we can make it. If you're going to have an education session with us, whether it's online or on site in the real world in future, we want it to feel like a Roald Dahl Museum education visit, so that's what we were going for. The challenge is, well, lockdown, obviously. You know, not being able to work, that was difficult. Um, flexible fellow, as I say, when that started to come in, started to make a difference, and we started to bring a few staff off to, to work on projects like this. But we'd never done anything like this before, because, if you recall, we were full, we were busy. We had a really busy day job before the pandemic, so we hadn't gone down the digital route. And a big reason for that, and I know you all know this, is that Although the technology for video calls and, and, and such was there, I don't know, 10 years before the pandemic, my goodness, what an adoption that happened in those, those early weeks and months. It totally transformed for all of us. It became normal in a way that I don't think anybody expected. Big question, what can we afford? You know, we're going to need some stuff, so that's a consideration. And do schools actually want this? We had to find out. So... We'd never done anything like this before, but coincidentally, um, because I knew that as an organisation we hadn't thought enough about digital, I had actually signed up to be part of uh, a leadership programme run by Culture24, which is a digital cultural agency uh, funded by the Arts Council in England, uh, about digital engagement, digital progress for cultural organisations. So that meant, at the time I absolutely needed it, I was in a network of people that I could talk to about digital issues. And that helped me connect with some digital people in the Arts Council in England, in the Group for Education and Museums. So there was stuff going on that we just tapped into. One of the most useful things I got from my Culture 24 course was this triangle, this digital skills triangle. And I think the most interesting parts of it are the bottom parts. Because this is what I, I kind of, as I was working with our learning manager, Natalie, to sort of identify the opportunity, set the, set the task to develop an online learning program. You know, we were conscious that the, the learning team didn't necessarily feel confident in digital. But if you start with what's your competency and your capability, what can you actually do? So this is what I do with digital. Send an email. Use the camera on my phone. Use Instagram. These are digital things that you can actually do. What do you achieve with those? Well, I communicate with people. I, um, I'm creative. I share with my friends. And then if you start here working about what you can do, no matter how modest it may seem, then you start to reflect, well, where can I take this next? So this is a really, I don't find it the most engaging model just on the surface, but when you start to unpack it, it really works. If you just start with what you have, it's more than you might first realise. And that was a really important point for us. The other thing was, I know my team, and I know that they are really, really great at working through an issue. They have a really, really structured process for developing new educational content, sometimes a bit slower than I think it should be. Bless them, no, I'm, I'm being unfair. I knew that if I set a task and trusted them, they would get it done. And what I had to do was agree milestones, so there was a sense of progress, but every time we needed to slow down and take longer, my job was to say, yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. These are the teams. So, Charlotte, Helen, Natalie, Grace, Helen, uh, uh, Joe, and unfortunately not here, but uh, tech goddess Amy was also part of it. So these are the team, struggling with which cable to use, all that kind of stuff. 
So what can we afford? Well, it's true to say that the bar to funding at that point in time was lower due to COVID. So, you know, if we could describe the potential, we were fortunate that we did get grants. I think it was easier because of the circumstances in which we were doing so. So we got a small local grant from the South East Museums Development Programme for our a bit of market research and our initial set of kits. We got a much bigger grant that was a big part of our, just our financial security in 2020-21 from the Arts Council Culture, Culture Recovery Fund first round. And then we got a specific grant to support the development of our live stream learning offer from the Art Fund. And they were extremely flexible about when we could spend that and, and so on. So they were really, really relaxed about that funding, which just helped when you're trying to figure stuff out in a pandemic. Not having stressed out funders is really great. So we had to answer the question, did schools actually want that? So we used our little grant to do some market research. We got a consultant to help us out, um, ran a survey that we advertised through social media. We got over 100 responses, which was all right. Um, she did five in-depth interviews, and the response rate was very encouraging. So we kept going. It was enough to reassure us that what <coughs> seemed like a self-evident idea was good enough from the point of view of teachers for whom it was intended. So we had to describe the potential in these funding bits. On site, as you remember, 350 sessions a year, basically full. Live stream, we reckoned that if we could deliver up to four sessions with like, four members of learning staff delivering a session at the same time, probably three time slots a day, that's 12 sessions a day, that's 48 a week. That's nearly 1,700 a year across 35 weeks of an academic year. That's a 380% increase in capacity. Mind blown. But actually, when you realise that there are 16,000 <laughs> primary schools in England alone, to hit that number, we just need one in ten of them, one class in one in ten of those primary schools, to be interested in a session with the Royal Dahl Museum. And maybe that's not crazy if you think about how many millions of books have been sold and how popular those stories have been over the last half century. So maybe it's not crazy. But maybe reality is not quite so fun, not quite so kind. So the, the 2020 lockdown slow development, you know, so even though it was legally permissible for the staff to come together and work on site, you know, I had to allow that, you know, the learning team didn't always feel comfortable doing that. When the UK government in Westminster announced, um, at least for England, the roadmap to, to recovery, so if, you know, the data allowed at a certain point in time, restrictions would start to ease. That was announced in February 2021. On the day it was announced, nothing actually changed. All the rules were exactly the same as they'd been. But that announcement, I noticed in my learning team, gave them a confidence that the pandemic was, you know, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And from that point, they started to feel more comfortable to come together and do more of the filming work that they needed to do. So this is a key thing I should have mentioned earlier, that our sessions are live facilitation interspersed with film shot around the museum. So you're getting to see the museum as you would if you were there for a real world visit. So we're showing the galleries, we're showing the same content online, in effect, as you would get if you were st physically stood in Greymouth in, in the museum itself. Um, our original plan was to try and launch something at the start of the spring term in 2021. So we aimed for January, but we hit July. <laughs> um, and in real terms, that means we hit the following September and the start of the next academic year. There were many tech challenges, tiny little ones, um, often a compatibility between a particular software or a, a, a Mac computer and another piece of kit. Just the team worked through it. They grumbled about it, but they worked through it. They had the right spirit, which is surely this can be worked out. And eventually they got there. Um, we started to have the challenge of schools wanting to come back in real life. Yay! But, you know, that's then something else for the learning team to do. So that was a, a capacity challenge. And we're still in recovery. You know, we, we are not all the way back to where we needed to be. This year, we're about 60% of where we were pre-COVID. Um, we've had some staff turnover. That's limited our budget or our capacity for marketing. And why would anyone book a live stream learning service from the Royal Dahl Museum if they don't know about it? And we have not yet had the capacity or the right moment to really make a big shout about it. Um, so that is still coming. But... How's it going? We've already had over 2,000 students in live stream learning sessions since July last year. Most excitingly, we had a whole school from Southport near Liverpool in Northwest England booking 16 sessions for their whole school. That's never happened. We get a class or two classes from a school come on site. 16 classes, amazing. It's not a trend yet, but it was a really exciting glimpse into what could be possible. Um, we are doing better, which is great, um, which means we're already starting to think about a second session uh, based on our on-site programme as the first session was. 
is going to be hopefully developed um, over the next few months. We've got a funding bid in progress for a hybrid project. So this is rather than a one-off school session, which is the meat and potatoes of our school offer, what we want to do is a longer term, maybe over two school term project where we're using online and on-site activities with schools and we've got a, we've got a local fund that we're, that we're working on that. I'll talk about that more if any of you wants to know later. We're investing further in delivery kits. So we bought Mac computers, we bought nice cameras. This is high-end consumer tech. It's not like super advanced. It's stuff that you can buy and use at home, but we bought you know, the, the stuff that works for us without going too far beyond because we don't have technicians to support the learning team. It's gotta be what's, what's achievable and realistic and, and, and we can maintain. But we're about to buy a karaoke booth. Yes, we found a little room tucked away in the, the back of the museum. <coughs> And if we can put a karaoke booth in there, we've suddenly got a soundproof environment to deliver from, which we haven't had today. And within our small site, that means we can release some space back for the on-site programme because schools are wanting to come back on-site. So these things, you, scaling doesn't happen neatly. You know, you've got to kind of balance all these different things in the space we've got. And we've had an inquiry for a US school. And that creates all sorts of issues like time difference and all this kind of weird stuff. But that's an exciting development. So... Feedback from teachers so far, trust me, they love it. And the reason they love it is because of these guys. So this is the filming, um, to create the film content for the sessions. This is actually delivering a session, that's what it looks like from our end. Um, the other end, it's the, you know, the kids in front of their smart board on the floor in their classroom with the teacher there. And they have activities to do in the session. You know, it's not just chalk and talk, it's as interactive as possible. They can talk to our educators, ask questions. And this is the learning team, bless them. They gave themselves little maquette models as Oscars. <laughs> well done, Willow. Well done, Willow. They are fantastic. Um, so some unsu unsurprising but true things. It all just takes longer. It, it just does. And tech is fiddly. But with the right spirit, surely we can figure this out. You can figure it out. You can find a way around. But more importantly, what I'd like you to know, if you're in the same situation, you know, trying to work out how you can develop your digital offer is, yeah, it's good to notice what other people are doing, but we can all experience the you know, prickling of, of fear of missing out and going, oh, they're doing it, I should, oh, you need to slow down and find your own way. And the way that you find your own way, of course, of course, is that you know your own organisation, you know your own people, you know your own strengths. Just because you could do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. You've got to take a breath and go, well, what would be right for us? We could have tried to rush out sessions. We could have taken some people, could have made the decision to take some people off fur uh, furlough and delivered some quick lockdown learning sessions, but we didn't think that was right for us for all sorts of reasons. Investment is important. It's not easy. You've got to persuade people to help you. We were lucky to do that in a time when the barriers to funding was lower, but you've got to invest. The future isn't free. And you've got to be clear why it matters and say so often to yourselves first and then to other people. And we don't know how it's going to go from here, but we do know that our future will be both on-site at the museum, because that is still incredibly important, but we know it will be online as well. That's me. If you follow me on Twitter, you might be disappointed I don't do a lot of it. If you find me on Instagram, there's mostly pictures of my kids, and sometimes I don't. Um, that's it for me. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Steve. That was a great one to get us kicked off today um, and talking about how we can take time to do it well, the importance of investing to do it right and being realistic about what you can do and what you can achieve. Next, I'd like to invite Mark McLeod. Um, Mark is a freelance museum professional and over the last kind of year, up until March 2022, he's supported Gearlock Museum in their outreach, engagement and education projects. He's also the co-manager of Andrew Carnegie Birthplace Museum, leading on education and engagement and events. Before undertaking freelance contracts, Mark worked at the Faulkner Museum and the University of St Andrews Museum Collection. Uh, thanks, Nicola, and the boys for doing the technology. You make it look so easy. <laughs> One thing that we learned, Karen, <laughs> is how hard it is to make this look so slick and so good. So I'm looking forward to hearing your audio as well. That's, that was the biggest challenge that I personally had. Um, uh, it's lovely to be back in Gearloch and thank you all for coming up to, up to Gearloch. Hopefully you'll enjoy the, the experience of the museum. Uh, I will talk to you, we're more focused in this presentation about the lifelong learners. The little ones are very important, but um, lifelong learning is something which um, 
we were able to focus on in Gearlock over um, the year of 2021. Um, but before we do that, and if you are getting a tour, um, I would definitely take it if you're given the offer. Um, Pauline, I think, is going to be doing it, and it's um, such an amazing building. Um, this is an example of one of the um, windows that they've managed to extract through the wall. Um, but it was opened in 2019, in July 2019. So as a venue, it hadn't really had much chance to, to breathe and to live when um, COVID arrived. And to get to this stage, I believe it's, you know, it's 10 years or more in the making from your fundraising, which building is it going to be, who's going to do it, how are we going to do it, all the planning, um, all the community work that happened. So when I was given the opportunity to come and, and work two days a, a week during 2021, it was a fantastic opportunity to try and tap into that audience outside of um, the museum because it was closed. So previously, the learning offer, it was a mix of, you've got your local uh, school groups, we had project officers come and um, raise opportunities and get people involved, get people interested. Um, but lifelong learning, as a community, they had this incredible uh, welcome, welcoming winter series of talks. And I know looking at the talks that they were doing, I was really jealous about some of the speakers they would get. Um, but at that point, I was based down in England, and it wasn't something I could come up to Gaelock on a Thursday evening for. Um, so one element that they were very quick to do before I arrived was start putting these talks online using Zoom, as Steve says, incredible, simple activity, simple thing to use. Um, and what they did here was they actually sent out a really helpful guide when you bought your ticket online. You got an email saying how to use Zoom, which seems so obvious if you're experienced at it. But when you think about the market and you think about the audiences they're trying to reach, if you're using an iPad, you do this. If you're using a computer, you can do this. This is how you mute it. Um, all those kind of elements. And I think that helped the audience all learn as well as, the, as they progressed up the, up the way. Um, and so by the end, there's less of those kind of awkward, oh, who's speaking? Who's, who's get, who's, whose dinner are we hearing about? Um, and the other really um, exciting thing that I discovered when they were doing their talks, the first half an hour was just a blether. It was just a chance for everybody who is on the call to have a chat with Karen, the curator, and see how everybody's doing locally. Uh, but it was also really exciting to see all these different people calling in from all over the world, um, all over the UK, as well as all your local people. So immediately, by putting it onto Zoom, this audience had expanded. And this audience is made up of people who come here on their holidays once a year, um, or perhaps they come um, once every five years, perhaps if people have moved away. But this was their chance to make a connection back. So a kind of a diaspora of visitors to the museum were all still really interested and really enthusiastic about what the museum could offer. And so the talks, by going online, were able to engage with these people. And at the start, we did do a, a survey with them. What are you interested in hearing about? Are you enjoying these talks? And everything was very positive. And we could tell that people would stay on the line all the way through the talk. It's a 40 minute talk, questions afterwards, this little time for a blether beforehand. But they, to me, that's a highly engaged audience. Um, as with many other uh, online events, you maybe had a 10% dropout. People would book it and then 10% wouldn't show up. Standard. Um, but because we had this audience, what we then started to do was, right, we've got Zoom, Zoom fees to pay for, um, but we also want to know, is this something that people value? So at the start, they were free. They were offered on a donation basis. So at the end, there'd be an ask, would you like to donate to the museum? Here's how to do it in a very simple fashion. And people were very positive. They were very responsive. Um, but we also wanted to um, we'll see, is there, a, um, is there a price point? Is there a value that they, would, that they would be happy to pay for? So we did experiment a little bit with our different audiences. So we had a full range of different events and activities. And some of this is in person. Some of it is totally online. Some of it is a mix of online and offline. But all of these, to me, are lifelong learning opportunities. 
our walks that we're talking about here were guided walks, the workshops, some were online, some were in person. An article, I learned a lot just by getting all the experts to write the information on it, but then that gets sent out into a whole new, um, it's about the building and brutalist architecture. Um, and that's sent out to a whole new audience, but it's all, to me, it is all learning. And it is all important learning, because these are people who can also support the museum by visiting, but do a little bit of financial support also. <coughs> So we weren't totally clear if um, people would be happy to pay for money. And this is one of these, I mean, I love a graph to try and visualize what we're doing. It's maybe a little bit busy, a little bit complicated, but the important things you need to look at are, or consider, the top is uh, November, uh, so the top is January 2021, the bottom is November 2021, and these are just some of the key events. Um, there was a whole pile of events, but these are just some of the names of them. The blue lines are attendees, but it is done on a proportional basis against the number of um, tickets sold or donations made, and the total income is the purple at the end. So it all is done on a proportional level. But what I would like you to notice is that even when at the first three, four lines you have along here, these are people just being asked for donations. This was a free event, the knit along, and then when we introduced the green, where we charge for tickets, people continue to offer donations, even although they are still buying the ticket. And there was a few voices that said, oh, you can't do that. It should be a free museum. You shouldn't be charging for it. Um, so we asked permission from the speakers to record the sessions. And by recording it, we can then clip it and edit it down so that it can then be on YouTube, hopefully short, shortly thereafter. And then it is free for anyone to look at. So the lessons we learn, apart from how to um, charge a little bit of money for it as opposed to donations and feel comfortable with it because we charge for entry to come into the museum so people value the museum. But we also um, got more comfortable with putting things up on YouTube and as you all know, once it's on the internet, it's there forever. So people will continue to discover it, continue to find it, which is a huge benefit. The, the knit along um, that Karen was leading and she's knitting as we speak today, <laughs> Uh, we had it set up, Karen was able to set it up so you could see what she was knitting and she was on camera. I would just be pushing buttons to spotlight her and we had six dedicated knitters who would come every Friday for three weeks um, to follow and learn how to do the gear lock pattern in a headband. But that video continues to get attraction, continues to have people come and visit it because it's a pattern that's sold in the shop. It's a, an object you'll see upstairs. There's a podcast done thanks to Expo North. There's a whole host of different things about that pattern. And whatever your learning style is, whatever your learning interest is, you can do it. And once it's online, it can have a life of its own. Long, long term, perhaps we can make that, um, an income stream out of it. We're not there yet. But it is that kind of opportunity. Once you've done the work, you put it in a place and it will continue to work for you, which I think is quite a useful lesson out of all this digital learning that we've got, that we've got done. So, to sum up some of the elements that we have learned. Um, we found the sweet spot for online last year was three pounds ticket price. Um, we find people would sometimes um, make that up to five pounds as a donation, just as a nice round number. Um, and they're all doing it online. We used art tickets, um, thanks to people like the Art Fund, who helped fund um, me to come and work here. Um, but also because the museum had been um, granted Museum of the Year in 2020, but the Art Fund art tickets was free to use. Um, it was quite painless once people got used to it, um, and it, as evidenced by um, showing people using it, that was a success. An online catalog of uh, content on YouTube is there. Um, it's starting to be embedded in the website more often as well, so we can use attraction, um, use um, the website to promote it, so you can bring it all together under your topics. All quite simple to use if you're comfortable enough using your website, and I feel for you. Um, but the team here are all really um, competent and quite happy to muck about on the back of a website and, and have a go at it, and we can all share it and look at it and help each other with it. Um, but it just gets out there quite quickly. Um, editing online content. So well, now those videos exist, 
um, we had a school come and ask us, oh, we're doing stuff about um, the clearances, we're doing it about the um, Battle of Culloden, and we're looking at destitution. Coincidentally, two or three of our speakers had included that in their topics. So we can just go into that video, we can clip it out, create these two to five minute long videos, send it to the teacher, put it online, put it on YouTube, and then it can be redone again. Um, you can add some clever slides or graphics if you want to, but really, you have an expert probably talking about an object that's in this museum that they can then be excited about coming to visit and trying to come and see it. Um, one of the ones is about a flower, the Flowerdale cannonball that you can see upstairs. It's on open display, you can have a look at it, and you can just learn that little bit more for free on YouTube, either by discovery or by direct from the teacher, and then pop upstairs and you can actually see the cannonball that's believed to have been shot from a ship out in the, out in the loch towards Flowerdale House. So it really, although it's a digital medium, I believe it can still be a really nice on-ramp into people experiencing the real object itself in the museum, which to me is, the, is a very important thing, but we are a long way away, as I'm sure Steve will um, um, agree to, uh, but if you can't make the trip immediately, you can still find out about it and then plan to make the trip later. Knowledge and experience of technology, so that grew various different ways, but as I say, even the audience, I think, were empowered and felt more supported by it. Even where there's private chats happening, saying, oh, my sound's not working, and we'll try and help them with it, um, but not to the detriment of the rest of the group, because everybody was learning how to use their mute button and how they were able to um, log in through their television, through their iPad, through the computer. I think that was really important. Audiences were forgiving. We had an absolute nightmare um, on one event, which I'm still traumatized by. Uh, in this space, I was sitting there. But it is something that we would all learn by, but the audience were, um, on the whole, very, very tolerant and um, supportive of us. So um, that itself, if you show vulnerability to your audience, we know that that is a positive thing because they know that you're human too. Able to reach a wider audience, as evidence on the map there, and I think that speaks volumes because they were just sitting there waiting. They would take the newsletters, they would take the digital um, contacts, the connections, they may be members long distance, but we gave them a voice, you could chat to us. Um, so I, I hope those kind of elements are what happens in the future. Um, and doing blended talks, so having the speaker here, having it online, um, live, is still something that can happen and you reach a wider audience than this room's walls can limit. Um, and the final thing is also, none of these are surprising, um, but the speakers were in their own homes, they were more comfortable with it, um, we could have speakers talking about all sorts of different things, um, whether they were five miles down the road or based in London or based in Edinburgh or whatever. Um, so that does open up wider, so their research gets out further. Um, and then they're really, really keen to come and visit as well to see what they've been talking about. Hopefully you have some questions later, um, but that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mark. It's really interesting to hear how you were taking the audience with you on your technical journey, um, when it didn't go so well and when it did go well, um, and the potential impact of the global reach that you made there. It was also really interesting to see how you were generating income from it, because we do have a lot of confidence to build in our sector about charging. Um, and that there is an opportunity there to have a free offering still for that free access, while also looking at how you could charge and create money from donations too. So thank you very much. Um, finally, last but not least, um, we have Katie Bowl, who is the Engagement Manager at National Trust of Scotland. Katie has a background in museums and education and has been working in heritage for 20 years, starting in historic houses in Western Canada and for the past 10 years has made the north of Scotland her home. She has significant experience in designing educational experiences that create positive outcomes for the participants. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm Katie, and oh my goodness, did I have FOMO. <laughs> we at the National Trust for Scotland went straight into furlough as quickly as we could. And there were redundancies that happened. And what it ended up with is me being the only learning manager, engagement manager, left within the organization. And I also had to look after some cows. 
<laughs> you laugh. I don't know how to look after cows. I had to climb under fences. I, I, yes, I grew up in a rural environment, but oh, I left um, because I didn't want to look after cows. Um, but in the reality, that meant that my time was limited. And um, my brain space was limited. And I was one of those people who, for COVID, felt I felt really challenged by the whole situation, and I found it hard. So I had to work through my own headspace to be ready to deliver, develop, create content, to get back to that creative space. And I'm glad to say that I'm back, um, and I'm glad to say that I'm feeling creative again, and I am knitting again, which is very important. But I didn't knit, I didn't knit for about four months, which for me was a big thing. Showed you where my head was at. And Culloden, which is a site that we, that I work at predominantly, didn't do digital schools, didn't touch them. We had an incredibly successful school program. We were delivering to about 5,000 kids, um, which when you consider, you know, outside of Inverness is a significant amount. And, you know, schools were traveling about three hours to come to us. So that's a big, big chunk. And we felt we were delivering pretty good. On top of that, we were doing about 180,000 individual engagements with people actually on the site to a site that delivers to around 250, 300,000, if you're feeling expansive, visitors per year. And there weren't any visitors and the schools stopped coming. And how was I going to reach out to these kids? How was I going to continue the programming? And there wasn't anything else that was happening trust-wide. And in order to work through some of my blockage, I didn't deliver Culloden. I did bats. <laughs> Um, so we looked at delivering through Google Classroom, which is something that a lot of Highland schools have access to. Unfortunately, we were able to link in through Highland Council to deliver um, Google Classroom activities and Microsoft Teams, because while lots of organizations work through Zoom, we worked through Microsoft Teams. And as an organization, that was the choice that was made. So Microsoft Teams it was. Um, we developed content on Brilliant Bats, which was a PowerPoint, um, but it was a PowerPoint with quite a bit of content in it. And then we started looking at our Culloden resources. And then feeling quite constrained by PowerPoint, um, when we were able to, we started developing some of our storytelling. And again, I didn't concentrate on Culloden because I found Culloden to be too much. So we looked at Hugh Miller's Cottage. And if you use this handy link that I provided in QR code form down at the bottom, you'll be able to access some of the Hugh Miller storytelling resources. What I found incredibly powerful about the Hugh Miller stuff, which actually happened later, was that it was something, the Hugh Miller content was gentle stories in a difficult time. We weren't changing the world. We were just telling good stories. And we were, it felt like a cup of hot chocolate. You know, everything felt so fraught. Um, and here were these stories that we could share. So for us, digital schools was very much a new frontier. And then we have this silly thing that we do every year, this anniversary event, which brings thousands of people to the site. And for those of you who have not been to Culloden during the anniversary, this is an example of the amount of people, some dressed in clothes that kind of look like 1745, um, trooping up to a memorial service that happens at the Cairn. And large portions of that memorial service are in Gaelic, and a lot of those people are not Gaelic speakers. So there's a real sense of place associated with Culloden. And maybe that's what I struggled with when I was trying to do digital programming. How do you recreate sense of place? How do you, how do you connect your geographic community with your site in a meaningful and memorable way when you're doing it through a screen? You can totally do this, 
but I had a bit of a block in terms of how do, how do I work this through in my own head. So 2019, um, we, so the COVID hit, what, March, February, March, and then the anniversary is April. Um, so we couldn't do the first one, we just canceled it. And we realized that the second one, we had a problem because we couldn't not deliver something. We have this huge community of interest. People want to find out about the site. And that's where we partnered with, with Expo North. And they supported us through the development and delivery of an online event. So we were able to create this online event with external expertise, um, because I was still looking after cows at the time. And, and they were able to support us in developing a fantastic program of speakers, and they were really generous with their time and their resources. And again, if you want to find out more, there is a handy QR code. Mm -hmm. I like QR codes. Mm -hmm. But what does 2022 do? It's early in the year. Are we going to be allowed to gather in groups? How many people are we allowed to get together? Am I going to have to ticket people onto the battlefield? I'm pretty sure I can have people outside. And we had all of this fantastic content that we created online that people were engaging with. And I'd like to say, just to go back to this, the 275th anniversary, which was a significant marker for us, we had people engaging from Japan, from the United States. Our global reach was huge, and it just went to reinforce the power of the site within the imagination and within our, it's not our diaspora, because it's not our diaspora. It is our community of interest that surrounds the site. So how am I going to do this? And uh, I'm not doing it with Global, with Expo North anymore. Um, minor panic, it's OK. Everything is all right. Um, so we decided we were going to do 2022 as a blended event. I think what the challenge for me was not actually understanding what it would look like. I didn't know what a large blended event was going to look like. I didn't know how many people were actually going to turn up to the site. Um, and so what we did is we produced a series of talks on site and the regular event, which we had around 1,500 people attend, which was challenging in and of itself. And then we also developed uh, 12 12 20 minute talks that were filmed on Zoom and then put on our website as a series of talks so people could just dip in and dip out at any time. So that content existed. So I felt that for those who perhaps couldn't be on site, didn't feel comfortable being on site, um, maybe thought the potential of being in a group of 1200 people might be too much for them early in the year, there were ways in. And that's what I really wanted to create through our blended event. I wanted to create a space where people felt comfortable and a space where people were able to engage with our story but not having to be on site. I wanted to tap into that global reach that we'd identified before. And I'm going to show you one other piece of work that we've been working on. So for us, yes, schools was a big thing, but also how do we deliver to this wider community? You can have a look at all of the stuff online through the QR code. During COVID, we had the opportunity to partner with a group called Virtual Visits. And they had received Innovate UK fund, so they came to us and it was a bit nerve wracking. And I found it quite challenging. Um, and we developed a 360 degree filmed visit of the battlefield. Um, it was narrated by Graham McTavish and it was a really challenging thing because, again, I'd never developed anything like this. For me, Culloden was always about sense of place. It was about being in the place, in the spot where the thing happened. And how do you get that across? So this is online. You're welcome to go and have a look at it. Um, we have continued to work with this organization to take it to the next level, to something that I feel incredibly proud of, but I just want to show you what the engagement was with this film, okay? We released it. The numbers speak for themselves. 21,000 tours taken in the first 14 days. It broke their server. 
Um, the global reach was, it, it blew my mind. I mean, I, I understood, you understand there's a community of interest around your site. You understand that there's a diaspora who wants to engage with your stories. But look at that. Look at the range of people who are connecting with it. People where I, in my ignorance, maybe wouldn't have looked. We didn't market this very well. We didn't really market this at all. We released it on our social media channel. And that gives you a sense of how people responded to it. Now, as I said before, we're working on a new one. It's very exciting. And actually, I feel like the new visit that we're creating, this new 360 degree tour, is going to give you sense of place. We have worked very hard, and it has taken much longer than we thought it was going to. Um, but you will get to experience an object in the space where it was found on the battlefield which is gonna be good. Um, I, sometimes I get called out for being negative about things, but this is gonna be good, guys. And when I can properly show you, I'll show you. But what are our next steps? That's a good question. Blended learning is here to stay, 100%. Blended learning in terms of school programming, yeah, it's there. And if you want to reach beyond your geographic reach, you can do it with blended learning. You have to be smart and you have to do, you know, the types of stuff that they were saying in the, the, the Roald Dahl uh, talk. But I also think blended events are here to stay. I think there are challenges around payment model. I think there are challenges around are people going to just want to be in a space? But there has to be a halfway house. There has to be a way that you can provide content in addition to supporting fantastic events on site. What I would say is that, my goodness, does it take a lot of people power. Because you have to have, you have, a, you have an event happening on site, right, you staff that event. But actually, you need the content creation that's happening before that. You need the the people running whatever you're running digitally to be there and to feel confident in the tech. The tech isn't that complicated ultimately, but you just need to feel empowered to use it. But I think there's huge opportunities and I think we're actually in a really exciting time and there's a real buzz about what we can do and I really feel like, you know, okay, yeah, we have to work through website issues, and we have to work through organizational issues, and yeah, we have to work through all of this stuff. But the future is bright. And that's all I have to say. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for the positive message and getting us to think about how the importance of recreating a sense of place and again seeing that global reach and that message of having to take time and the capacity and people power, so therefore that need that we came back to the start for investing um, and looking at, at collaboration as well as we come together as a community to help grow that people power. And um, we're going to, because we're running a bit over, just take a very quick two minutes, if anybody wants to stretch their legs while we just reset and then hopefully hear a lot of questions from you. Thank you. Welcome back everybody. Um, yeah, I think we're running over a little bit, so I'll just get going and I'll um, open up with just one question and then I'll open the floor to everybody else. Um, just from all the discussions we're having there, it's very clear that over the last few, few years, remote education has been gaining traction. And I'm wondering how you see museums potentially sustaining those virtual formats as we move forward. Um, anybody like to go first? Katie? I think we need to think quite carefully about our commercial model. I think we have to find the balance between our community engagement free offer, and what we can legitimately charge for. I think it's one of those challenges that learning departments have been grappling with over the past 10, 15 years. 
and it's something we have to accept is going to have to work within the digital sphere. I do not think you can charge for things that aren't worth charging for. Mm. So you have to build your skills and find a way that works, and, and you know, finding your price point that works for your site. That's, I think that's the only way forward. Yeah. Can, I, can I add to that? Yeah. Yeah, so at the Royal Derby Museum, you know, we, we focused on an offer for schools because we knew that the business model would make most sense. You know, so our schools program is a, is a charging model. You know, you, you pay for the session because you're paying for the time um, of our facilitators, you know, and that doesn't come for free. Uh, and because we're an independent, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with talking about money and thinking about the implications of money. And so developing um, as close to an online, uh, uh, an equivalent of the on-site offer online means that a school books and pays for an online live stream learning session. And I think one of the key things, it wasn't just the adoption of, you know, video live stream technology that, um, that happened in the, the spring of 2020. It was the fact that it became, for more people, a way to do work. So the notion of paying for professional services through a live video call was also like, oh yeah, this is totally normal. Um, my wife is a consultant, she does loads of work, you know, through video, and it works, it's great. Um, and it, I don't know, I think that was a big shift. And that was something that we identified, and we were definitely, because we were trying to think long term, thinking about, you know, we could sustain this because it fits in with a, a model that already works in the real world. And the shift that we see in society and technology that's happened rapidly in the spring of 2020 will support that. So, yeah. Mark, just thinking as somebody who worked in one of the smaller museums mm. we've got here today, and with volunteer impact, there can sometimes be a lack of confidence in charging, and you referenced that a bit in your speech. Maybe you could mm. tell us just a little bit more about how you navigated that journey. Um, well, Gaelock Museum, also an independent, um, and also one that's, um, so you're charging it when you come in. Um, but, so, so people know they're happy to pay, they're happy to, to come in and do that. But from an education point of view, when schools visit, it is a free offer, certainly for um, Highland schools, local schools. Um, and that's the way you'd want to keep it. Um, but um, I enjoy Steve's model because if you are reaching outside of the Highlands or even reaching outside of Scotland um, to get people to value it and to get people to, subs to pay for it um, I think it's perfectly fair to charge for it um, working in museums down south yes you charge for education it's expected but um, in the Scottish museums there's very few of them that I've, I've never worked in one that has charged for education because it's just seen as part of the educational offer within the local authority that sometimes those museums are getting some funding from. So it's a, it's a natural progression to offer it for free to your local schools. But yes, be willing to charge it. And, and it means you've got confidence in your service that it's high enough quality that people will pay for it. I think that's the critical point, actually. You know, I was working in Imperial War Museums like 10, 15 years ago, and we started introducing charging. I had to write the policy on charging for school sessions, and there was understandable, great reluctance amongst learning colleagues. But the, the point was, do we believe what we're doing is worthwhile? Does it come for free? So you say yes to the first, you say no to the second, then charging is okay. Because you said it, Katie, you said it, Mark. It's got to be worth it. And if it's worth it, then it's okay. Yeah, we charge. We've charged for 12 years. Um, and, you know, we have a, for a half day morning session, it was three quid, for a full day session, it's six quid per student. And if your offer is strong enough, then they are willing. I appreciate, you know, sometimes we're dealing with issues around rural poverty or, you know, we're dealing with other, you know, the cost of transport is a significant issue in the Highlands of Scotland. It is, I mean, it's astronomical. Um, so there has to be ways to you have to be flexible you know and you have to think about ways that you can create strong offers or that that are equally good but i do think that there is something around the valuing your work as a learning person valuing the content that you're creating and being confident in that content that 
it's okay to put a price point on it. Mm -hmm. And it, that's not about excluding. It 100% it isn't about excluding. And it needs to be, and we need to be clear about that because there are schools of multiple deprivation that, that you know, frankly, kids need to have the life-changing opportunities you can have within a heritage environment. But there are also schools who are not. That's Karen. my feeling. Okay. Can I just, just um, go back to what Mark said about you know moving it beyond our local schools as well? So for us, it's almost not worth our while charging our local schools, is it? Because there are only six of them. There's about, some of them only have about ten kids. So we're never going to make a lot of money out of that. So actually, the move to the digital is the only avenue where we could, I think, start to... I mean, that's maybe a very... Um, personal kind of thing for us because we are so so remotely located but yeah I, I don't really see us ever despite the fact that we do think we're worth it yeah. and our offering is brilliant that we would ever um, charge our local schools or, or find it worthwhile in fact just this summer we've agreed to give every child in every school in the parish um, a free ticket so they can come in as many times as they like over the summer and what we have definitely seen this year, and um, Pauline, who's on our board, I'm sure will agree, we have seen some of the schools coming again and again and again. And I think if we started charging them, then that might, the number of times they would come would reduce as well, which we absolutely wouldn't want. It has to be a commercial model that works for you, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's not one size fit all, it has to fit. Yeah. Yeah. But the digital, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, mm. and of course the Heritage Hub, that the Digital Heritage Hub that Ms. Mm. Heritage Highland is putting together, I guess it makes sense to go through that, uh, to go at it through that avenue rather than doing it separately. So it's something we'll need to get our heads together on. Yeah, it's definitely um, about looking at a, a flexible model, so mm. therefore what works for your local community and being able to sustain that and navigate and work out. Um, how you apply that, but then also looking at the opportunities if you're digital and you're reaching out globally to a far larger audience who are at a greater distance, as we've said already, then there's a real opportunity there. Yeah. Just, just um, a PS to that though, the proviso is that the children with the free car are coming for nothing. They bring their parents who pay, or join as family members. Yes. So, you know, so that uh, actually the idea is that would encourage them to come back. That's what we're hoping, they'll have come here for a, an activity or a session or something, and then they come back, and we've actually seen that the you know, kids are coming back in with their parents or family, with brothers and sisters or whatever. So it's relationship building as well yeah. for the future. Thank you. For us, we've got a bit of a flexible model because we actually don't charge for schools, and that's part of our offer. Is we actually have a, a free schools program. Um, however, because I talk about a lot doing working for a lot of partner organisations who do charge for school visits, so when working in collaboration with them, that's where we have a little bit of a not a mismatch, but um, so sometimes what we'll do is with a, ch um, a partner charges, then we will sponsor that partner to do some kind of free sessions, basically by paying for it. But if they would, yeah, so the schools would come and we would um, pay the organisation to do that, which means it's the level playing field for anybody coming to visit, whether it's one of our sites or actually one of our partner kind of organisations. So. And I think the nice thing is, is providing choices. You know, so that's what you spoke about. Well, you know, the the, the live um, event might be charged. You know, and then people have a choice. They can also donate, but they don't have to. You know, and then there's the free, you know, cut down, you know, but still engaging mm -hmm. content afterwards. There's a choice. And when we talk about, you know, charging schools, there's a choice there. Schools have budgets. I'm not here to say they aren't, you know, stretched or, you know, pulled in lots of different directions. But it's not that they have literally no money. So there are choices. Yeah. And the more that a blended offer that we all talked about today can provide choice, well, I think that's, a, that's just a healthy thing, right? I think as a, as a collaborative um, across the Highlands, we did a project, Highland Threads, and it was just a donate model for um, people to attend the events. And they did generate not insignificant income to support the sector. And it, was, it therefore gave people who freedom who could afford to pay a bit more and those that couldn't to just either attend for free or just to donate a couple of pence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any questions from the floor for any of the speakers? Liz? I'd like to know what principles or guidelines you've all used in creating digital content that is very accessible to a wide range of people. 
Who would like to tackle that first? You, you talked about accessibility, and that was interesting because you were very honest and said what you t developed in the past wasn't really accessible. So I'm really now, I would really want to hear what you're, you, what guidelines, what principles you're using, because that can help all of us. Because if we don't do it as we design things, we're going to have to do it as add-ons, which is always more difficult. We need to design for accessibility so we create the material well in the first place, and then it's much easier to adapt it. I'm oh, going to start with, we're struggling is the answer, <laughs> to be honest. Um, no, I mean, we haven't actually produced much learning content that we would feel is really, really great in terms of accessibility. I think the issue we have with having it digitally accessible is um, there has to be multiple different formats for different people to engage with it, whereas when you're doing something live, um, or in person, it, it, you're able to adapt it, whereas the content, when it's online, it's, it's kind of harder to kind of meet multiple audiences' needs. So a lot of the stuff that we've, we're kind of working on, as I said, yeah, I, I can actually give any, that's not, sorry, that's a really bad answer, um, because we haven't really found a, a solution um, for, for that meets multiple audience needs, basically. Um, so have, have any of you spent time putting together, sort of thinking about the guidelines that support accessibility to ensure that that content can reach as many as possible? As, I, I suppose that me being... Um, I trust others to do it in as much as... So we're putting it on YouTube because YouTube will do subtitles for you for free and they are really good quality, except they do not do the word gear loch ever. <laughs> so that is used a lot in our YouTube. So there is a, you know, there's a piece of work there for somebody to go in and do a little bit of editing as it, as those things last. Um, we would also um, make sure that there's menus attached to the presentations. So if you're only there because you want to hear about the Flowerdale Cannonball, you can clip straight to that bit or just for the questions or the start or the end. So trying to give people, it's an accessibility thing, it's, it's a search engine optimization thing, but it's also just a useful thing because if, oh, I know I've seen that in a video somewhere, I just need to go and do it. As you see, if you build accessibility in from the start or you think about everybody at the start, at some point in your existence, it will suit you to have done that, to go back and do it. Um, but trusting people like organizations like YouTube to do a good job of the subtitles allows us to mm -hmm. save a huge amount of time from doing the transcription. Um, and as I said, um, before I arrived, the team were putting together emails that sent out to people, here's how you use Zoom, this is what it looks like, this is what you need to do, this is how we can help you. So I think those were kind of, to me it seems um, a little bit trite to say that that's our accessibility policy or our plans, but that I think was hugely helpful and hugely um, beneficial. When we're doing our stuff, it, it, it has been a, a process of trial and error. Um, to a certain extent, but there are things that we do. Um, so our challenge is the difference between a live event mm -hmm. and pre-recorded content. So when we create pre-recorded content, everything needs to be subtitled, but we have transcripts. And then those transcripts are moved through a subtitling process, and then they, so, so it is correctly put in. But when you start having live events, then you run into issues like how do you pronounce this Gallic word? It just comes up as it doesn't make any sense. Or how do you work with different accents? And and I'm sure you can yeah. appreciate some of the challenges around that. Um, we are looking at different ways to deal with it, but we are nowhere near anything yet. Um, and I know that there are organisations who do have good practice around that, and we're really starting to develop our links with those organizations. I guess when we're creating um, like the, the, the pre-recorded things, we're doing quite a bit of user testing um, and we're user testing with as wide a range of people sort of in breadth and depth as we can. Um, for example, one of our tours has got music associated with it and 
I was really worried about how that would work um, for people with sound sensitivity. Um, and we specifically targeted several people with sound sensitivity to see whether or not they were able to still engage with the content um, while there was music happening. And one of the things that came out of that is the, is there a way we can turn the music off? Is there a way for the user to turn the music off in order just to engage with the content so there's not that distraction happening? I know I'm just talking about particularly sound sensitivity, mm -hmm. but there, there's a range of different other things. You know, being able to access the stuff with PDF. You know, until we started doing this, I didn't even think about it. Hands up, didn't even think about it until we started doing this and, and, and realizing. And then going back to, fortunately for us, our IT departments, because they're more conversant in digital accessibility specifically for web and, 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 and listening to them. Sometimes I don't listen particularly well, but listening to them and, and hearing what they have to say. And then building the time in, building the budget in, making sure that when we're doing it, as much as we can, we put it at the beginning. But it's not perfect by a long shot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would just add to that a little bit from my own experience with the Museum's Immersive Network as well, how we've learnt as we went along and we took a bit of our budget to employ a live transcriptor and he was worth his money in gold. He did an amazing job um, of, because he just is better than Zoom or anybody else doing it live. There were less errors, less mistakes, it was far more accurate. Um, and also we added in thinking of that visual description because while to me, digital is a real tool to open up accessibility because you're meeting a lot of people in terms of physical access. There are still people with sight, vision and hearing that you have to consider. And so we always start with a visual description as well to describe sort of who we are, what we look like, what our background is, so that people know what they're looking at if they have visual impairments. And as I say, the, the live transcriptor was, was, was worth his money in gold because he just was so accurate. Um, have, you, have you considered some of that for the real deal? I, I mean, I think you've offered a really good challenge to us, you know, and I don't think we've gone anywhere near <laughs> as far as we could do. I think the nature of our live stream learning offer for schools, you know, it has accessibility in it insofar as it allows us to breach the sort of 90 minute driving radius that schools build on site. So it's more accessible an entire school from Southport in North West mm. England, okay, online, which is brilliant. So there's a there's a there's an inherent growth in accessibility. We talked about cost earlier. It's cheaper to have a live stream learning session than to come for a real world session. Plus, you don't have all the logistical costs, which are the real cost of school visits. You know, the the cost of the coaches, the cost of the extra teachers for for, for supporting kids on the trip. So it's more accessible in those ways too, um, because we deliver to kids in their classroom together. It's a bit. I agree with Mark's point about you know one has to trust the sort of the platforms and the setup that you're you're working through. So we trust that because we're delivering to a class of kids together, the teacher is you know aware of how to be inclusive for her, or sorry her his class, um, you know on a daily basis. And so this is just another part of the 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 kids' everyday schooling. Um, so I think those things are all important. We haven't we haven't gone far enough. But again, a key element which was mentioned earlier is that it's live. You know, yes, there are filmed bits, but they're all facilitated by a live educator. So there's that you know, best form of interpretation. Always a human being, so adaptable, so full of knowledge, can adjust. You know, turn on a pinhead, and that is a key part of us, key part of it. But you've you've offered a really good challenge and as and when we move into some of the kind of content that I've you know, heard about today, you know, pre-recorded stuff or more you know, open ticketed events, that kind of thing, none of which we've done yet. We've thought about it, but one thing at a time, focused on the school offer first. But when we do move into that territory, yeah, we're going to have to get that right. And we like to do things as well as possible. We're fortunate that one of our staff is a, a BSL you know, user. So and we've, we've done BSL in, uh, events in the past, we we're also planning to have a real focus on offer for, for SEND groups, special education needs and disabilities groups, on site. But I think that that might build towards, well, actually, there could be an online offer. For I, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if there's going to be a demand for it, but I wouldn't rule it out. And as and when that happens, we'll try and do as well as we can. Fail a bit, but learn through the process. Thank you, Liz. I think that's a really important question and everybody should be considering full accessibility for any 
um, experiences that they're looking to, to develop. Are there any other questions? I was going to ask one about um, the amount of competition there is online. Obviously, we all live our life online, we're all doing so very many things. So you're going to a world where actually there's already a lot of things there. And, um, and I guess it's a question in many ways actually about marketing because what you offer is great but actually quite niche so how do people find out about you? You know it's great that other people uh, you know, around the world or um, other people in the UK might find out about you but there's also other museums online, there's the BBC they're offering lots of learning resources and things like that so how can you go into this confidently going we're going to target the right people and they're going to find out about us? Thank you. I think, um, yeah, you, I'll come to you, Katie, as you were all <coughs> done to not do great marketing, just putting it out there. And I think we can be quite guilty of, um, if we build it, they will come approach of just landing it. How do we make ourselves stand out? How do we market it? How do we push that content and get, get discovered and found online? You pay somebody to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what they're doing? <laughs> Honestly, um, I've got a range of skill sets. These are the things I'm good at. These are the things I need help with. Um, even within the, the trust as an organization, you know, you, you, sometimes you need to ask for help. And I think that increasingly grant agencies will come to understand that actually, because it, it costs money and, and you need to weed your way through the chaff to find somebody who can actually help you deliver. And I think you need to build marketing into your budgets. I think it can't be something that's 50p because um, marketing costs money. And I also think that you need to be very aware of who you're targeting with your content. Start with your audience, always first. Who is your audience? Who are you targeting? And how are you going to be the best? What is the best way of communicating to them? And I, I genuinely think that, that uh, that's difficult to say for, for smaller organisations, but I still think that you can have really high impact um, if you know your audience. So where are they going? What are they doing? Are they, you know, is it, is it the, the poster in the town, um, the village square that's going to make a difference? Or is it targeted ads through Facebook? Um, but sometimes it's worthwhile asking people who do it for a living. Um, because we didn't do so well. We got amazing traction. Imagine if we'd actually marketed the thing. <laughs> do you know? I mean, like, it would be, it would be insane. And um, imagine if we had marketed it continuously. What if there was a campaign around it? You can only bake the service once. Yeah, that's true. You can only break the service once. But, but if you have, I mean, the fact that sort of Oh, yes, please. You know, if, if you have a unique product, and the first, well, let's talk about marketing in terms of four Ps, you know, the first of which is your product. So, can you say, think about the audience, not just in terms of advertising it, but before you even start creating anything. And what are you creating? Is it unique to you? And if it is, people will come. I mean, I offer you the example of the Gilly Do video that we did for our Museum of the Year. We, did, well, we didn't market it as such. It brought us so much attention. It was quite the opposite. We um, had a fabulous marketing outcome from that thing that we put out. It was a very local story that just happened to have Sam Ewan attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, it just, if you have that unique product, maybe... Sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Yes. I mean, that is, you know, just that free thing that sometimes yeah. happens. I work for Birmingham Museum, so I'm the head of digital there. Right. So I do have some insight. Yeah. Um, and I know sometimes things take off and they're great, but uh, other But other as museums, we, we all do have our uniqueness, don't yeah, we? Yeah. And so I think that's what we need to think about, because like with, with the digital hub that the Highland Museums are going to be producing, <laughs> There's an element where we are targeting aspects of the curriculum, obviously, and we can all feed into that because it's a kind of it's a theme that, that crosses us all. But there's got to be unique stuff in there uh, as well. Yeah. yeah, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I, just, I, yeah, yeah, can I add something to that? Um, 
So yeah, what Katie said, you've got to spend money on it. And it's not always going to work, is it? You know, sometimes you get that perfect storm. You know, it gets picked up by somebody who's got more followers than you and, and so on, you know, and you get something that goes viral. A lot of time that doesn't happen. And we have limits. You know, we have limits to our budgets. So what we're looking at, we haven't really promoted our live stream learning offer yet, for reasons I'll, I'll, not, I'll not dwell on now. Capacity has been, been a big part of it. And our capacity hasn't suddenly transformed to have a national or international campaign about it, good Lord, no. Um, so, you know, it's out there in a very quiet way. Um, we get inquiries about school visits, and sometimes if we can't find a date for them to visit on site, you know, as now schools are more wanting to come back, we can suggest that they might do the online thing. But what we're planning to do is our marketing team is starting to restore its capacity. It's only happened in the last month or so. Um, is we're going to target two areas with our Facebook ads and our you know things. One of those is happens to be the London Borough of Waltham Forest, who very nicely got in touch with me last year and said we're interested in becoming a national borough of storytelling. We don't really know what that means, but um, we want to talk to you about. It. Okay, fine. So just because there was an interest there, we you know we delivered what we call stakeholder sessions, like pilot sessions of the the live stream learning offer to head teachers in Waltham Forest schools. So. We don't know if that's going to go further, but we have the whole world to think about where we could market. We've got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Waltham Forest is as good a place to start as any. And the other place, I mentioned we're trying to develop this sort of uh, longer term project model using a, a blend of, of in-person and, and, and online. And we're aiming that at Buckinghamshire, our own county, because there is a truth um, that for some, you know, for some museum services, it's their local schools that don't come because there's this sort of assumption with two things, like, oh, the parents bring the kids, so we don't need to. And it's like, if we're going to have to go through the hassle of hiring a coach, we're bloody well going to put the kids in the coach for at least an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, so, so it's not that no buck schools come, but it's certainly not our most visiting county. Counties a little bit further away, you know, will come. And of course we care about our local schools, of course we do. So actually we want to have that stronger engagement, we want them to celebrate the heritage of, of Dahl's works in our county as a, as a cultural treasure of our county. So that's why we're targeting Buckinghamshire for an online model. So they don't have to worry about the, the logistics thing and the hour and a half in the coach to make it worthwhile. You know, that's why uh, a blend thing. And the on-site stuff in that project model we're thinking about, yes, there'll be an opportunity for Buck schools to come to the museum, but actually what we mean is doing outreach to them, mixed with the online bit. So the, the coming to the museum is important, we're not saying it's not, but it's not the only thing. We're trying to make it convenient for schools in our own locality. Mm. So I suppose in terms of how do you let people know, you have to pick and choose and do what you can. Yeah. Targeting um, who your key audience is, as you said, identifying them, yeah. targeting them and being able to invest as best you can in um, what you're able to deliver and identifying the people to support you to do that if you don't have the skills yourself. Gillian, just quickly as an organisation that wasn't so focused on schools, mm -hmm. um, did you put quite a bit of effort into marketing your content? Um, not really. And as I said, we, uh, so a lot of our platforms are actually not that huge in terms of kind of social media, particularly when we're working uh, with different groups, um, which is why we kind of worked with kind of bigger platforms like BBC and Twinkle, etc. So a lot of the work that we did that kind of became a lot bigger was because we were working with those, the bigger platforms already had those audiences. Um, and so we've got a lot more traffic from that. Um, on the reverse, however, when we were creating new content, particularly early during lockdown, uh, it was about not knowing our product. It was the, almost the opposite, when we're like, we have this thing, we don't really know what this thing is, we don't know who'd like this thing. And so, we, yeah, early on with digital marketing, we did have some challenges there because unlike pre-COVID, we were pretty sure what our offer was and we were sure um, it, was, it was good, but actually, yeah, when we were changing that, we weren't actually sure if it was good or who exactly it was aimed at because again sometimes we're producing content that would be for schools but folks were learning with their families you know at home etc so I think we've really learned that yeah we've got to really figure out who the content is for before we market it and ask it for it to be marketed and put out there. And I think that's an important point about partnerships as well finding out where your audiences are already sometimes that can be a good way to reach them and to then pull them into you through other avenues. Um, we're probably getting close to time. Are there any sort of final questions? 
Can I ask what, yeah. what you feel is the future of podcasts? Um, I didn't know what a podcast was when COVID came along, but in Fort William we produced several podcasts which have seemed to have gone down very well, but will, will they be the cassettes or the VHS um, <laughs> videos of, of uh, 10 years' time? Question on the, the future of podcasts. Uh, has anybody got some experience? Mm, only of listening to them. Okay. Um, and my wife's a huge podcaster, the amount of conversations that she starts with. I was listening to this podcast. Uh, it's brilliant. And I think it's, you know, in a way it's a, you know, I'm not the first person to say, it's a golden age of audio content. But like anything, there's good and there's bad. So a one-time audio talk has value. But I think a successful podcast is like a successful TV or radio show. You know, it's either going to keep going and it's got a format, it's got, you know, that, that produces its own content and keeps going, you know, like so. Is it, um, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue, or something like, you know, like a real format that just keeps going, can evolve a little bit, you know, can change its personnel, but keeps going and has that long-term loyalty. Or you do a limited series, you know, and you go, right, you know, so you take a, like a famous comedy like Faulty Towers, and it's like, it didn't keep going, like The Simpsons has kept going, it did, 13 shows and stopped, you know. So I think, like anything, it's how you do it, and knowing knowing your intent. So if you've, got, if you've got a set story to tell, you want to tell it in a fixed, fixed series, do it, stop, and then you've got the content out there. If you're trying to do something that's consistent, try and do something that's consistent, I, I guess the risk is you fall between two stools, that you start and you aren't clear on which you're trying to do. So your content comes out you know, intermittently. And therefore, it's harder to build an audience because people don't quite know what they're going to get. Mm. That it would be my guess. I don't have direct experience of it. But, you know, the, the, the podcasts that I listen to are the ones that turn up. Or I find one that's just a limited series, or they enjoy the series, and then move on to something else. Yeah. I, I was going to say, we did a podcast. I forgot to say, we did a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a limited series because it was from the beginning of The Rising to the end of The Rising, done what happened each month of the rising, the exciting things that happened. I found it really challenging um, because we, just the, the nature of writing a podcast was not something that I'd written before um, and it wasn't the same as the interpretive writing that I'd done before. It was a different type of storytelling. Um, and I think there's some people who are really good at doing that. And um, I think it went over it's gone over reasonably well. I think we've had about 7,000, 8,000 people listen to it. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, certainly it's not, you know, horrible histories. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think that we chose to make it limited because um, we just didn't have, it was, there was issues around capacity in terms of if you start something, you have to keep it going. Like, like you mentioned, yeah. and we would not have been able to do it, 100%, we would not have been able to do it without the support from our volunteers who are sitting at home wanting to do research and work, because it just didn't have the ability. Um, they did the bulk of the work. I did window dressing, um, and then, um, and, and framing story alongside my operations manager, and then we were able to put it out. And, and it's available, but I think you have to think about that. Do you not feel in digital you can go in like 42 different directions and not do any of them well? So you kind of have to say, here are the things that organizationally we have capacity to do. Um, these are the things we can do really well. These are the strengths within our organization. These people are fabulous storytellers. These people are visually work really, really well. These people are wonderful learning producers, whatever, mm -hmm. and deliver against that. And in, and in terms of your question about whether or not they're going to be the VHS cassette, I, I think there's probably people who listen to, you know. Well, go on listening to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and I do think that, I think they're pretty great. So, I, I can't speak from, like, what the future of podcasts will be, mm -hmm. but just manage your resources. Mm -hmm.
they've certainly seen a huge resurgence over the last kind of couple of years and I think we now do like to curate our audio content in the way we have TV as we've moved over to streaming. We now like to have that same freedom with what we listen to and podcasts gives us that. So it's, you know, it's, I guess, looking at your own kind of balance of the time invested to create it, but a time-limited series is always there. It's an asset that will always work for you. Yeah. And I think they're going to go on, but again, I'm not an expert. I am going to point you to a session at the next Expo North, Radio Killed the Video Star, which I think is going to be exploring that very issue. So at the conference on the 15th and 16th of June, there will be a session that's looking at that resurgence in audio and that real demand of yeah. it from the audiences. Can I just say, do you know what I think is cool? Limits. So I think it's great if you want to, you know, if you've got a podcast, you put limits on it. So maybe each episode's like five minutes, but that means you can do 20 episodes rather than two really long ones. And you just need to think about, well, like anything, study the market, you know, study what's out there and kind of go, well, why do I like this one that somebody else is doing? Why, why do I like it? Oh, it's because it actually fits into a certain window in my day. Now, you're using yourself as a model for the rest of the world, but it's a fair place to start. Um, and you can, you, know, you can craft it based on what you've seen works elsewhere. I think this is true. I think of, like, you know, we've talked a lot about Zoom and, and Teams and, and video calls. So I, it's just, somebody said earlier, it's just a tool. Um, and we've all been on, we've all been at good meetings We've been at bad meetings. We've been on good phone calls. We've been at bad phone calls. We've been at good conferences and less good conferences and so on and so forth. And so the same is true with all these digital tools. It's like, do it right. And that doesn't always mean do everything that you could do. Do what works and, and lean into that. And if that's a quick one-time thing, great. If it's a longer-term thing, great. If it's short, great. One of my favorite analogies is like, because as I showed you, we have a very physically small site. My favorite analogies is like, it's tennis. Tennis is a game of limits, right? How do you know somebody's great? How do you know Serena Williams' great? How do you know, um, you know Roger Federer's great? Because they're playing within the court. You know, the genius is hitting the line, is finding the angles within limits. And if we are small and we have limits, and we all do, we can be a national organization, we can be a tiny independent, but we have limits. Know your limits and play, play like Serena, play like Roger in those limits. That's the fun part, I think. Don't think I can end better than on a tennis analogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we wrap up, are there any, any final questions? Thank you all very much. Um, it's been really great to have you all here. Thank you, Steve, for coming so far north to be a with pleasure, us today. A pleasure. Um, and to Gillian and Mark and Katie as well, your contributions have been hugely valuable today. And I'm sure that over lunch and as we go on, there'll be a lot more for us to explore. Um, but I think my key takeaways from today are that need to sort of take time to think about what your limits are, to be able to do the best that you can, take the time to deliver it, keep things like accessibility in mind, and hopefully together, I think by collaborating with each other and with other partners, we can meet our audiences and hopefully deliver high quality content for them where they are. Thank you.